such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is about parents who killed their five-year-old and kept it a secret for nine months. For five years, the horror of what was happening was suspected, and yet time and time again, nothing was done. The sweet girl had come so close to a chance at love and care, but it was taken from her when she was taken from them. She had no choice about the family she had been born into, and she had no way to escape. If you don't know, it's my absolute passion to tell these stories. I mean, no harm or disrespect when I do so. So if that's something you'd like to support me in doing, all you have to do is make sure you are subscribed, the post notification bell on, giving this video a thumbs up, and leave me a nice comment down below. I also wanted to tell you guys, if you're not following me on Instagram, you absolutely need to. I have been posting different true crime case reels on there, as well as different safety tips and just different things to be aware of in this world. So if you would like to Follow that and see all of those because most of them are much different than my true crime cases I post here. Then make sure to follow that. That's just at Brooke McKenna underscore. So it was 2006 in Canada and the Sinclair family lived in Winnipeg. This was Stephen Sinclair and Samantha Kamach who had the five-year-old daughter named Phoenix Victoria Hope. Now Stephen had actually given that name to her as soon as she was born. However, her parents were actually both teenagers when she was pregnant with her and when she gave birth. Samantha was only 18 and Stephen was 19. Neither had a great upbringing either. They had both been taken from their parents when they were younger and they had grown up in the foster care system before aging out at the age of 18 when the foster care system no longer helps you nor looks for an adoptive family. Stephen was taken at eight years old due to violence and alcohol abuse at his home. Three years later, Stephen became a ward of Child and Family Services, meaning that he had no one to be his guardian, even temporarily, no foster families. He had tried three different ones out and none of them really worked out. So at that point, he was just kind of in the system waiting to age out. Samantha was taken from her physically and emotionally abusive family and she soon became a ward as well. And Steven's brother actually introduced the two of them and they soon became a couple. Now, of course, they had very similar upbringings, which brought them very close, but it also meant that neither of them had graduated high school and weren't working anywhere, and so they were relying on social assistance. This isn't something that is necessarily an automatic for a foster child or one that ages out of the system, but it is something that they both were going through. And they were also both believed to have some sort of substance abuse issues as their families had. Now, they went to the boys and girls club together which was basically like a little program where these foster children could go and get support and learn different things they could also make some money Stephen was known to teach children how to play guitar and Samantha would make snacks for movies that were happening there and it was just like a group setting for people to go and hang out with one another and Samantha was known to have trouble expressing emotions to anybody who really knew her and was said to be quite immature but on the other hand, Stephen was known to be more shy and more, I guess, normal, you could say, as far as emotions because the foster care system, child and family services, can create a lot of turbulence as far as mental health in these children and adults. Samantha already had a son in the foster system. She had been pregnant at 16 and ended up not wanting to fight for the child and at 16 being, you know, of course, in the foster system, they wouldn't allow her to keep the child and so the child also went in to the foster system and became a ward itself and so as soon as Samantha was pregnant again with Phoenix, well, nobody really knew until she was actually giving birth. And many were worried once she did give birth that due to neither Samantha nor Stephen having parental guides to help them or show them what good parenting was, it would lead to a cycle of abuse that would of course, go down to Phoenix. Now, social workers especially believed this because they had gone to Stephen and Samantha's home that they were living in and found that nothing was prepared for a baby. They had just given birth. They had those nine months to figure things out and they didn't even have a crib for her nor any clothes, nothing that showed that they were preparing. When questioned about her firstborn son, 
Samantha said that she had actually had him taken from her because they believed that she would hurt him because she was an abused child. She had gotten zero prenatal care with her first child, nor with Phoenix because she didn't like doctors, especially male doctors. She had watched a lot of abuse happening on TV with them and she just didn't want to be around them at all. She didn't go seek out any female doctors. She just didn't have any appointments from the time she got pregnant to when she gave birth. And she also told social workers when she had Phoenix that she wasn't emotionally ready for a baby. So when Phoenix was born on April 23rd of 2000, social workers came to the hospital to take her into the custody of Child and Family Services. Now, Stephen and Samantha had originally told them that they actually didn't want to parent Phoenix. They weren't ready and they were going to give up custody willingly. But then Samantha changed her mind. The social worker informed Samantha that many moms did feel this way, the sudden guilt, the sudden feeling of maybe I do want to keep the baby when it was being taken away. But social worker informed her that most of the time that changed and the parents ended up wanting to go ahead with giving it to Children and Family Services. And so they decided to go ahead and have the social worker take Phoenix and Stephen dressed her and they all walked out together and the social worker noticed that after this, Samantha really didn't show any interest in Phoenix, didn't tell her goodbye, wasn't mourning her and was just kind of joking with a friend that was at the hospital with her. Now this newborn in desperate need of touch from her mother, the comfort of a family, was placed into a temporary shelter before they could find foster parents to place her with. And at this point, Stephen and Samantha were allowed visitation rights, meaning they could see her, but they couldn't take her for long periods of time. Most of the time it would be supervised and they did not have custody. Now, they actually went to see her every single week. They also joined a support group for parents. However, Samantha refused to take a psychological assessment, which Child and Family Services were asking for if they did want to fight for custody of Phoenix. Now, when Phoenix was five months old, she was returned to her birth parents. This was allegedly because Samantha and Stephen went through training on how to care for this child that was supervised by social services. So somebody came into their home and taught them just how to deal with a child, different things to do. And they also would come and see how Stephen and Samantha did when Phoenix came over to visit and just how they parented her, how they loved on her. And it was observed that Phoenix was learning attachment in her foster home, meaning she was learning to love those people who were taking care of her for the first five months of her life. She was in good health. And so the social worker hoped that she would also attach to her parents. And so they decided to rip her out of her foster home that she was doing well in and send her back to her birth parents. Samantha finally did a psyche eval. However, the psychiatrist was only asked to see if her flat affect towards her daughter could be that she had depression. And ultimately, he didn't believe so. He believed this flat affect was almost part of her personality. And so he wasn't looking for if she was a good parent, if she had any mental issues, and he did believe that there were problems within the marriage and about sex and about parenting between Stephen and Samantha, but that wasn't his job to call out. Now, the psychiatrist also said that Samantha was this closed book, not wanting to say everything and not really anything at all. Although flat affect can be a sign of mental illness or sociopathy. Now, they got custody of Phoenix and a social worker then claims that the visits stopped because the family suddenly vanished without warning and she believed that they had moved so she didn't further press the issue. By January of 2001, Phoenix was nine months old and a caseworker from a local shelter would take her to the doctor. Now, Child and Family Services have no idea why she was taken to the doctor, why she was at a shelter, and they didn't look into this. But then exactly a year after Phoenix's birth, she got a younger sister. Samantha and Steven had another baby on April 29th of 2001, and her name was Echo. Now, at that time, Phoenix was still living with her parents and they were also allowed to keep Echo. 
Unfortunately, this is when the trouble would get even worse. Two months later, there was a call coming from their home with the threat of domestic violence. You see, Stephen allegedly found a hickey on Samantha's neck and she admitted to basically having an affair on him with her ex-boyfriend and the father of her first child that she gave up to the foster system. Samantha then called the police saying that Stephen assaulted her. When they arrived, Stephen said that Samantha took their child tax credit they were getting for Phoenix and Echo and spent it on drinking and that she was often drinking and out of control. He was worried about the safety of their children with her. Yet Stephen was charged with the assault and Phoenix and Echo were in the care of Samantha for the next two days. When Stephen returned, he said that he found Echo dirty, hungry, and smelling very badly. A social worker went in at this time to see how Stephen handled the kids and reported that Stephen fed Echo, played with her, would hold her a whole ton, and that everything looked good. But Samantha wasn't there. Now, of course, Samantha and Stephen separated soon after, and Stephen said that Samantha abandoned him with their two children. So Stephen was actually fighting for full custody at this time, but the next month, Echo would be deceased. You see, on July 15th, at only two, almost three months old, she was rushed to the hospital by Stephen, where she had died of a respiratory infection. Stephen allegedly found her in bed, not breathing, and rushed her to the hospital, but it was too late. This was deemed to be just due to the infection, not lack of care, nothing that Stephen could have done or didn't do. But at the funeral, Samantha, went up to her body in the casket and saw blood on her and immediately created a scene exploding saying that Stephen had assaulted her and killed her. Police were called and social workers eventually found that there was blood on Echo but it was from the autopsy and it wasn't cleaned off. After that, Stephen and Samantha's families actually had to separate the visiting hours for this baby. But this wouldn't be the last child of Samantha and Stephen's to pass away young. Five years later, in 2006, a 12-year-old boy went to the police and he claimed that for the last nine months, his father and stepmother had been pretending that his five-year-old sister or stepsister was alive. When asked if she wasn't, the boy then told police that he had watched his father beat his stepsister, and then when the boy went to check on her, she wasn't breathing. The next month, this 12-year-old went to his mother and told her the entire story, and she ended up taking them to the police station. Investigators found that Samantha had moved on from Stephen and was living with a man named Wesley Carl McKay. They had moved to Fisher River Cree Nation for a while, but had recently moved back to Winnipeg together. There were no signs that Phoenix was missing. They were still claiming her welfare checks. Friends and family were questioned, and they said that they hadn't actually seen Phoenix in a while, but when they asked Samantha about it, she would say, you know, she's with her father or another family member right now. Her father, Stephen, had moved to Ontario, but Phoenix was not found with him either, and he said that Samantha had her at this time. The nursery school that she had been enrolled at was called Wellington School, and they had record of her enrolling, or Samantha enrolling Phoenix, but Phoenix was never seen at school. And when Stephen heard that his daughter was missing, he began searching every single school, everywhere possible he could think of that Phoenix might be or someone she might be with, but he was finding nothing. While Samantha and Wesley were brought in to the police department for questioning, Child and Family Services had some explaining to do. You see, even though Phoenix had been placed back into the care of her parents at five months old, a family support worker was with her at that time. However, the help was discontinued long before it should have been. This wouldn't be where Phoenix would stay though. For months, she was moving between Samantha, Stephen, Stephen's sisters, and his friends. In fact, he had two friends who lived nearby named Kim Edwards and Rohan Stevenson, who kind of acted as her godparents. And she was also bouncing between foster homes as well. There were several occasions that 
social workers were called in regards to Phoenix's well-being just after her sister Echo died as well. All of these callers were worried about Phoenix's safety with her primary caregiver, Stephen. Now, social workers obviously didn't make this a priority though, as they had no idea where she was actually living most of the time. They also didn't offer support to Stephen after one of his daughters died and he was caring for Phoenix alone. And this entire file on Phoenix was closed in 2002. That was until the hospital called CFS. And that was because they had seen Phoenix and believed that she was being neglected. It was February of 2003 and she had come in with a piece of styrofoam stuck in her nose that had been there for months. And the doctor was actually worried that her father wouldn't give her the antibiotics that she needed because the people who brought her in were Kim and Rohan, Stephen's friends. And due to this and Stephen's alleged substance abuse that had started after the death of Echo, Phoenix was taken from Stephen and Rohan and Kim were given temporary guardianship. However, Stephen would often come and get her. She was still living with him part of the time and another call was made about him, that he was having this party, there was lots of drinking and Phoenix wasn't getting adequate supervision. But when the social worker showed up that night, Stephen said Phoenix was upstairs with his sister who was a grown woman and that the party was only a few friends. CFS decided to take Phoenix into custody this time no one really knows why this time over other times, but she was taken and the social workers were kind of just watching her to see how she was. And she really did seem to be a happy girl, but they did notice that she would call every female mom, which showed signs that she wasn't really attaching to her own mother. And as she scooped up the little girl, Phoenix called Henson mom. Telling. A three-year-old child developmentally is very attached to their mother. They'll usually hide behind, you know, their mother or father's legs. Um, their mom's their lifeline. Phoenix didn't. She called me mom. And when she was brought to the caregivers at Place Louis Riel, she called them mom too. So to me, that just shows that there's no... Um, consistent care provider. It's a lack of attachment to, you know, to a mother figure. However, Samantha heard that Phoenix was in the system and wanted her back. She was saying her life was much better now. She could handle Phoenix and she said that Stephen wouldn't really allow her to have access to her daughter anymore. It was also revealed at this time that Stephen's sister, and it's unknown if it's the one that was watching Phoenix during the parties, was charged seven years prior with manslaughter involving a child in her care. Stephen also had admitted that he wasn't ready to care for Phoenix. But a social worker named Laura Forrest had written in this file that neither Samantha nor Stephen had showed willingness to be involved with the social workers and they didn't show commitment to get their child back. She said that because they had grown up in the system, they didn't like the services provided, they refused it, and Laura claimed that because of this, the system had stepped back, not because of lack of child welfare issues, but because they just disregarded the help. She wrote, Phoenix is in agency care now and it would probably not be in her best interest to be returned to either parent at this time or until they can show something to indicate that they can and will be more responsible and protective of her. Kim and Rohan, her godparents, were given access to Phoenix at this time and they were going to be her temporary home. They were actually called a place of safety because they weren't necessarily foster parents. So they had to get a license to operate and maintain a children's foster home. And they wrote on the paperwork that they wanted to be foster parents because they loved Phoenix. Kim and Rohan said that Stephen was not a typical father, but he was good with Phoenix when he did have her. Then when Stephen wanted her back, they told social workers that he was still grieving the loss of his other daughter and he was drinking a lot and Phoenix wanted to stay with them because she had grown to love it there at their home. By 2004, Samantha decided she wanted to see Phoenix and so she went to Kim and Rohan's home and picked her up for a visitation. However, Phoenix wouldn't be returned. Stephen's friends had no right to fight back as they didn't officially have custody. So they called Stephen to ask, you know, can Samantha take her for a while? And he had told them it was okay as long as she of course brings her back, but she never did. And for a while at this time, 
CFS had no idea where Phoenix was. They sent out several letters to get a response from these different people, and then they just dropped it until Samantha came to them and was requesting financial assistance for Phoenix. Now, twice in 2005, Social workers received calls about Samantha and her new boyfriend, Wesley, and the possible neglect of Phoenix. Nothing was done. They even had allegations that Samantha was smoking rock, and this was in Phoenix's presence, but the investigation found this to be inadequate. Three months prior to the boy coming to police claiming that Phoenix had been killed, it was reported to social services that she was being abused by Samantha. When a social worker went to check on her, Samantha wouldn't let her in the door. And so the social worker just left without seeing Phoenix and then closed the file five days later. At least 13 times, Phoenix's safety was in question and most of the time the case was closed without even looking at her, without any effort. Not even a surprise visit to the home, which is a requirement. And also the face-to-face -face contact that is needed to understand what she is going through and to just see how she is doing. Since the beginning, it was described that Samantha had this flat affect and indifference towards Phoenix. And Phoenix at this time was not attending the nursery school, daycare, or any community programs because she was still too young and she didn't necessarily have to be anywhere, which made it easier to hide the fact that she was being abused. Child and Family Services, who had been watching this family since the beginning, couldn't even keep everything straight because there were so many different social workers that were changing so often. Over a five-year period, 27 different social workers had worked this case. 27 different people filling in for those who left or moved or quit or did an inadequate job. Yet time and time again, nothing was fixed and they failed to even look into the man that Samantha brought into Phoenix's life and had two more kids with. This was in 2004 and the next in 2006. And right in the middle of those was the disappearance of Phoenix. Because Wesley McKay was a dangerous man and they would have known that with only a little research into their own systems. You see, he was on record with beating an ex-girlfriend with the leg of a bathroom sink. He also had two different children who were wards of CFS, and it was written on file that he posed a threat to children both directly and indirectly in terms of his propensity for violence. Before being arrested, Wesley and Samantha both showed Phoenix to investigators. They showed them this little girl and said, here she is, she's not missing. But that wasn't Phoenix at all. They had taken a little girl and pretended it was her. During the interrogations, Samantha was surprisingly willing to talk, but her story did change often, and she really wasn't that emotional when telling it. A couple things that we talked about that I'm a little bit confused on, though, because I, I feel like I kind of have two different stories about it, so mm -hmm. I want to make sure I got it right and get the truth about what happened, okay? The morning, um, or the, the day that you guys were at home when Phoenix died before you went to Wes's dad's she house. Was, she was okay, she was breathing. She said that she and Wesley found Phoenix lying on her back in the basement. She wasn't breathing. Wesley tried to do CPR and Samantha believed that she had died due to choking on her own puke while she and Wesley were out at Wesley's dad's home without the kids. Yeah, when we came back, Said it looked like she, she choked on her puke. That's what I said. That looks like me. That she might have died from choking on her puke. Right. There was a puke spot there. She also admitted that the day prior, Phoenix had her head banged on the floor by Wesley, and so she thought that that could be the cause of death as well. She said that she hit Phoenix in the leg with a pole often. When investigators pressed Samantha on whether Phoenix was hurt the day of her death, she said that she might have been hurt, but she was okay. She then said that she never hit her, but Wesley was down there with her in the basement and she didn't know what he was doing. She admitted that once they found her, they wrapped her in trash bags and buried her in a landfill. So when you guys went down there and you found her naked laying on her back, is that when you said that Wes tried CPR? Okay, and then that's when it got into where you went to get garbage bags and you guys wrapped her and we talked about that already. We talked about stuff like that already, yeah. Yeah. But we, we did like, 
Like I told you, we didn't wrap her up right away. We didn't wrap her. I was in the So, how long did you wait to wrap her up? Like I think you said before it was maybe a couple hours, right? Yeah. It was, it was something that wasn't supposed to happen. Now, Wesley's interrogation went a bit differently because he didn't want to talk. And when he did, he was emotional. The investigator continued to tell Wesley he was a good man and he was sure it was an accident, but he needed to know why he did this. And as infuriating of a technique as that is, showing empathy to a killer, it worked on Wesley because he ended up saying he was worried about his own children and finally he broke down crying saying that he tried to save Phoenix. Wesley said that Samantha was a mean woman with no heart and often treated Phoenix like an animal. He then said that they both committed the murder, that Samantha put her in the corner in the basement because she was being loud and Phoenix came out of the corner and he threw her on top of a bag of clothes. He said that they left and then he got a call from his 12 year old son from a previous marriage who stayed with them often saying that she wasn't breathing. After disposing the body, he said that Samantha wanted to go back and chop her head off to get rid of DNA. She also asked him to scrub the basement floor and then they painted over it. And that's when Wesley agreed to take investigators to her body. I was scared. I bet you were. Then I told her. And then she said, let's, let's go bury her somewhere. Okay, right. We know that. <laughs> so we were after up and we went. Her. Yeah. Where'd you bury her? In the bush somewhere. Where? By the garden stump. Yeah. Who all went when you went to bury the child? Just me and Sam went. Yeah. What happened to Daniel? I told him to stay home. Yeah. I told him to move back. Yeah. So, you'd be able to take me there? Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. I appreciate that. I just want this over. I know you do. I know you do. And you know what? You're doing a good thing. I know you do. Good job. I know, I'm going to spend the rest of my life in jail. Hey, hey, let's worry about dealing with the stuff right now, okay? All right? All right, uh, it is uh, about 9.51 p.m. We're out at the uh, location. Um, Carl Wesley McKay is, uh, is going to take us exactly to where uh, Phoenix Sinclair is buried. you want to say while we're here you, this is your time yeah uh, I've done this for the Phoenix to recover her body okay because she deserves a proper burial and I've done it for my, my boys as well as myself and Samantha all right the search for her began and she was located in the Fisher River landfill buried now, the medical examiners found that fractures were all over this five-year-old little girl's body on top of unhealed injuries. She was likely in constant pain for days before her death, and her injury was compared to being in a serious car accident. Wesley and Samantha were charged with first-degree murder, and Wesley's son, the one who came forward and was the hero in this, said that they were not crying nor emotional during the trial. He actually testified he was shaking, he was covering his face with his hands, and he admitted that his father and stepmother often beat Phoenix, and they would shoot her with a pellet gun just for the hell of it, and he said that Phoenix got so used to it, she didn't even cry. He said he would often hear her crying through the vents, to the basement and he would find her naked curled up in this little ball freezing and he would try to turn the heat on only to be yelled at by samantha samantha would often laugh when wesley was hurting her and he said that after they found phoenix deceased samantha simply said to watch his sister because they were going to go 
dump her. As the trial progressed, both Samantha and Wesley turned on each other, saying the blow that killed her was done by the opposite, and they then had to have a share of sin between them because Samantha was getting extremely angry and wanted to attack him. They were both sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, and that's when Wesley began to make an apology to the courtroom and to Phoenix, but couldn't finish because he was crying so hard. Samantha, on the other hand, stood up and said, everybody can say what they want to say, call me whatever you want. I never did this, and I know that, and Phoenix knows that. And then she told the judge that nobody will know the truth. However, 48 hours later, Samantha did an interview where she confronted this reporter about an article they had just written saying that that she killed her kid. That was what the article said. And she said it angered her. And she argued with him saying that they didn't do it together. It was just Wesley. And she said that she did fail her. She failed Phoenix and Phoenix never deserved any of this to happen to her. Samantha said that people can say she has no feelings, but not everyone cries and she holds her tears and her hurt inside. She said, I didn't kill my daughter. What did I do to her? I loved her. Then she began to say that she was a victim of Wesley as well and that she would often take the beatings so Phoenix wouldn't have to. The whole time, she didn't want to be on record. She asked to read the reporter's notes and she finally said that if Wesley had never entered their life, Phoenix would still be alive today. She also asked the reporter why he believed that she was emotionless, as if she didn't realize that's how she appeared. Now, because of this interview, Wesley Carl McKay was also interviewed with his lawyer because he wanted to shed some light on who he said Samantha really was. Now, he was upset after she had said, what did I do to her? I loved her because he said that she would give her cigarettes and beers from a young, young age. And Wesley said that his sister once brought over Christmas presents for Phoenix and Samantha threw them in the trash saying she didn't deserve them. He also said when he left to drive trucks, Phoenix would be devastated and appeared terrified to be left alone with Samantha. And when he came back, he, she would run up and hug him and not let him go. He claimed that once overnight, Phoenix had eaten an entire loaf of bread because she was starving and Samantha that was infuriated. Now the inquiry into the circumstances surrounding the death of Phoenix was completed in 2013 and was released the next year. Now for this inquiry, there was an attempt to impose a publication ban on the social workers' names so they couldn't be called out for their wrongdoing, but this was denied. And so during the inquiry, the commissioner counsel said, how was it that Phoenix could become so invisible to a community that included social service agencies, schools, hospitals, family, and friends as to literally disappear. It was also found during this time even more disturbing things that had happened and that Samantha would often force Phoenix to belittle herself even as a five-year-old baby. I mean, she, a friend of hers testified that Samantha would have Phoenix say things like that she was an effing bee out loud. There was also a lock on the outside of the bedroom door where Phoenix allegedly slept and most friends didn't see her when that lock was locked on the door. It was also confirmed that she was smoking crack, Samantha, during when she had custody of her. A friend also suspected that Wesley had sexually assaulted Phoenix because she started wetting the bed and she was also touching her genitals at this time. If this friend did call Child and Family Services but wanted to be anonymous as to not get in trouble with Wesley and at this time the social worker said she couldn't take this complaint seriously if it was anonymous and nothing was done. Now most social workers who testified said that they didn't actually remember the details of this case or much about Phoenix at all. Now Stephen did testify that he did love Phoenix with all of his heart and she loved to watch movies and play outside and run around her house in her little skirt and he said she was always having a good time when she had toys everywhere. But he did admit that when Samantha got pregnant, they didn't know if they were going to give her up for adoption or what they were going to do. But when she was born, he fell in love with her and didn't want to let her go. Since he didn't have parents to look up to, he watched those on TV and tried to learn from them. All those years later, when Samantha took Phoenix for this visitation and never returned her, he did wait a few days after Samantha took Phoenix to do anything about this because she was her mom. And 
it looked like Samantha was trying. But he then did call CFS and told them that he was trying to locate her. He said that Samantha would often get really frustrated as a mother, which concerned him. It was also found that Samantha and Wesley had moved to Fisher River to get away from social workers, so they would stop coming around and asking questions. And Wesley's 12-year-old son, who was the hero who turned his father and stepmother in, testified again that Phoenix was physically and verbally abused by both of them. And Wesley would not only shoot her with this pellet gun, but would also strangle her until she lost consciousness in a game called Choking the Chicken. They would then force her to sleep in the freezing cold basement, naked, and she would have to eat her own vomit when she wasn't fed. The day of her death, Wesley beat her for over 15 minutes, and Samantha just stood there and watched. This 12-year-old did more for this baby than 27 social workers, and especially his parents. Now, this inquiry found that 80% of Manitoba children in the system are Aboriginal, just as Phoenix was. And the high majority is said to be due to the lack of finances that cause these families to live in poverty. And they live in these houses that are not very good and they struggle with addictions without any support. This inquiry was one of the most expensive in Manitoba history, costing 10 to 14 million Canadian dollars. Now the commissioner, Ted Hughes, found that children and family services failed Phoenix Sinclair. He said, to truly honor Phoenix, we need to provide all of Manitoba's children with a good start in life and offer to the most vulnerable an escape from the cycle of poverty and vulnerability. Now, due to this case, a program was started for children called Lord Selkirk Park Child Care Center that was built. And this allows 47 children at a time to have their needs met while their families live in poverty. There's also an outreach program that allows for workers to help families navigate through this crisis. Basically, it's a better version of child and family services. There's also now the Healthy Child Manitoba Act that makes sure that no single government is in control of the well-being of a child and needs community participation. However, the act does not protect children's rights, which are continually needed to be fought for, as the foster system has shown that they do not care about the well-being of a child or what the child wants. The Manitoba government has decided though that they need to focus on prevention instead of protection because prevention is protection. And they started using many of the recommendations from this inquiry. And social workers now have to abide by the every child seen every time rule, which was supposed to be happening, where the children are actually looked at when a home visit is made. An action plan called Changes for Children was also created for budget increases, better foster care, and child safety and accountability. But will this be enough? It seems like time and time again, there are horrific cases of negligence and failure of CFS all over the world, not just in Canada. And all these plans are always spoken about, but nothing really seems to change. Social workers appear to be overworked, thrown from case to case, or lacking on the job and not protecting these children. However, the social worker that was working on this case the longest or so it's believed, it was called Chief Abagos. And she said that her caseload was manageable and didn't affect the services that she provided to Phoenix. Now a GoFundMe had to be set up to purchase Phoenix's gravestone and Rohan and Kim, the couple who would often watch her, were the most devastated by this. They took it the hardest because they were truly attached to this little girl. They loved her so much. Rohan said that she would call Phoenix, Phoenix the fatty boom boom because she would eat so much food, which really is sad because it means that she wasn't getting enough other places, but she would come to them and she felt safe enough to eat as much food as she wanted and to really truly feel safe. She would actually call him all the time, big guy. So they had little jokes and it was just shown that there was an attachment unlike what she could have ever gotten with her family. This was a safe place for her to grow with people who truly cared about her, who would have done anything to protect her. And yet CFS demanded time and time again for her to be sent back to her biological family just because they were biological, not because they were in her best interest, not because they care. 
Ellie Butler is another horrific case that I've covered where it could have been prevented if she wasn't continually allowed back into her abuser's home. Phoenix Sinclair got five years of hell on earth. Five years where she was trying to grow up, where she got glimpses of what life could be, of happiness. And time and time again, she was shown she didn't deserve that. She was shown that these people who were supposed to help her were really just making everything horrific and were, were putting her back in places where she didn't understand why she was being hurt. She didn't understand anything. She was a baby who her parents didn't care about. And that's it. But to Phoenix, they were the people who were supposed to be taking care of her. And a five-year-old doesn't know what being taken care of is unless she's shown the right way. And that is the problem with just ripping these kids back and forth. They see what they want and they're told they can't have it. Not that they should stay in a place that continually abuses them. But it just begs the question, why are they going back? Why should they be put through a traumatic situation again and again and again? Families are made up of love, not blood. Do you think that if Samantha never met Wesley, that Phoenix would still be alive? Or was it really, truly her mother's just anger at her that would have had her killed anyway? Phoenix Sinclair was failed by Child and Family Services. And thousands every day are going through the same. So don't forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough. And I love you to absolute pieces. Okay. Bye.